welcome to the Defence Science Showcase for National Science Week 2018. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the Chief Defence Scientist, Dr Alex Zelinsky. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Science Week. Um, let me acknowledge uh, the, the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land which we meet and pay my respect to the elders past and present. Firstly, let me begin by thanking very much for making time in your busy schedules to join us for the Defence Showcase for National Science Week. The uh, Australian Defence Force has an extraordinarily strong tradition of embracing science and technology and leveraging uh, technology for warfighting success. So it's quite fitting that we all come together at National Science Week to acknowledge the contribution of science to the defence and security of our nation. National Science Week's been going for over 20 years. It's a very well-established tradition, started in 1997, and it's great that we're actually uh, celebrating it here in Russell to kick it off here for defence. But uh, there's certainly, uh, for your families and friends, uh, there's over a 1,000 events being held across Australia, kicked off on the weekend. And I think it's just a great way to not just celebrate science, but also encourage our young people to consider careers in science, technology, engineering, maths, and, uh, and associated fields. So um, if you do get a chance to encourage one of your uh, fam fam family members or friends to attend an event, uh, very well worthwhile uh, doing. So one of the things we'll be doing here today is uh, celebrating some of the achievements of our defence scientists and uh, who continue to uh, receive national and international uh, recognition. So you'll be hearing from my colleagues in a few moments. But uh, I just want to just recap, it's probably a great time during National Science Week to re recap on some of the prestigious science and technology awards that have uh, been awarded to defence scientists for con conducting leading edge research. Uh, in May uh, this year, a joint uh, DST and Melbourne University team won two innovation awards at the Civil, uh, C Civil Security Congress and Exposition in Melbourne for, uh, for developing capability to detect and forecast the spread of disease. So certainly very interested in national security context, like worrying about diseases such as Ebola and other things like that. But it's actually got a, a, a real dual use in the, tense, in the sense it can also be used to predict influenza outbreaks and how they'll spread. So this award-winning system uses health and environmental data to produce a near real-time assessment of the likeliest presence of di disease and how it'll spread. So it's now become available to all uh, health, health authorities across Australia to assist, assist in influenza forecast. In fact, it's been used this winter by the Victorian Health Department. A few days ago, uh, Dr. Christine Shanahan, who's one of our presenters today, uh, was recognised for her outstanding contributions to defence in the inaugural ADM, uh, Australian Defence Magazine, that is, uh, Women in Defence Awards. Uh, Christine received the award for a consistent delivery of engineering expertise and problem solving to defence, which has resulted um, in improving soldier survivability while also saving dollars for the department. So well done, Christine. And, uh, and also I'd like to acknowledge uh, Janice Cocking, Dr. Uh, who was awarded the Public Service Medal in the June Queen's Birthday Honours for Outstanding Service uh, in the field of Defence Science and Technology. Uh, one of Janice's main contributions was her leadership of the Collins Submarine Science and Technology Program, which resulted in remediation of the submarines, and today the Collins is acknowledged as one of the world's best conventional submarines. Um, Janice has just retired, just literally a week or so ago, uh, but uh, we do really want to acknowledge her contributions. Uh, one of the things Janice led for us to, uh, in the last year and a half has been the $730 million Next Generation Technologies Fund, which places innovation is innovation at the centre of industry and academic programs and with the role or the intent of developing game-changing capabilities for defence. Um, some of the pro programs that are coming from the Next Gen Tech Fund include partnerships with uh, CSIRO's Data61 in uh, cybersecurity. One of the pr first pr uh, products that's come out of uh, that program, joint program with Data61, is the cross-domain desktop compositor. And this system allows for content from multiple computers uh, of different classifications to be se viewed securely on a single screen. So all of us in defence, I can't wait for this device to come on other than flipping between monitors. And uh, I know it was successfully trialled at HQ Jock uh, 
just uh, recently. So, and in June, this system received an Open Government Award as an exemplary public service project that demonstrate innovative and disruptive use of technologies. Well done to the team. So now we've got to get into our product, which we can all adopt. Uh, earlier in the year, uh, a joint team from DST and BAE Systems received the Business Leader Award for Innovating for Success. The award was for developing corrosion management systems for the, the lead-in fighter uh, Hawk aircraft. And we'll also find uh, future use for the F-35 JSF fleet. Now, this is quite big in the sense it's not just for Australian, Australia's fleet, but in fact for the global fleet, this technology is going to be adopted. So it's a fantastic outcome. Um, among our uh, young scientists being recognised is uh, Luke Rosenberg, who has presented the uh, Fred Natheson Radar Award by the Institution of Electrical and uh, Electronic Engineers. This award is for contributions to radar by engineers under the age of 40 and was presented to Luke at, uh, at one of the major radar conferences. So what this really means is that Luke is probably one of the best young radar engineers in the world and he works here for Defence. So that's the kind of measure of the capability we've got in our organisation. Last week it was great to see at the Defence DNI conference, the Defence and Industry conference, uh, the minor sustainability category under 20 million uh, dollars. DST and Mackay Consolidated Interest in Industries were joint winners for the uh, developing and man uh, and manufacturing radar absorbing materials for use on Navy frigates and submarines. So, so this was a novel material that was developed by our scientists, manufactured locally and it reduces the signature of naval platforms and increases their survivability. So it is truly really, uh, outstanding. It is a, a national capability that we don't share with others. So it's important to see that we're not only working commercially with companies, but we're actually working on uh, capabilities that give us the a technology edge or a capability edge, I should say. So today we're here to also um, highlighting some more technologies that are under development, they're on their way. And, uh, and this is uh, something we're uh, showcasing here for you and we believe it'll be opportunities again for industry and academia to partner with us. So today you're gonna to hear a short pitch of about a minute from each one of our presenters here. And uh, in a minute you won't get the full technical brief on this, on this, uh, this work, but you'll get a sense of a sketch uh, of what is happening and uh, so afterwards we will be ha having morning tea and we really want you to interact with our scientists uh, to discuss their work. Um, the pictures will be followed by a presentation by Natalie Stevens and Mon uh, Monique Ho Hollick, uh, two of our uh, young scientists who will talk about uh, small satellite and space uh, communications. Space capability is one of the nine priorities of the Next Generation Technologies Fund. And uh, as you all know, spaces have become an Australian government priority, uh, marked by the establishment of an Australian space agency. Uh, we have a small uh, satellite space research program, and uh, it's being conducted in collaboration with the uh, University of New South Wales, Canberra. And last year, we successfully launched the Buccaneer Cube satellite basically shoe sized sat uh, shoe box sized satellite which has orbited the earth several thousand times to date and its job is to help optimize the performance of the Jindalee over the horizon radar uh, network Natalie and Monique will provide you information about this exciting project but now I'm going to hand over to Daryl Johnson who's going to be the MC and the timer for our pitching uh, and uh, enjoy and uh, I'll come back at the end thank you thank you so thank you, um, Dr. Zielinski. Our um, first presenter uh, this morning will be uh, Dr. Christine Shanahan from our land division. And as you heard, the CDSA Christine was awarded the Women in Defence Award for her engineering expertise. Today, Christine will talk about her research on how the ADF can benefit from the military of things. Just four years ago, the Internet of Things connected 9 billion devices globally. In the next two years, that number will grow to 75 billion. Modern society's appetite for devices and desire to be connected to others has created a trillion dollar industry that will continue to expand. So how can the Australian Defence Force profit from this juggernaut? Well, let's begin with the challenge of operations in dense urban environments. 
I've partnered with a South Australian startup called Miriota, and we have created small, cheap data terminals that send a short burst of data direct to low Earth orbit satellites. These terminals can be seeded in their hundreds across the battle space to collect information vital for situational awareness, such as has a chemical warfare agent been released near friendly troops? So if this Internet of Military Things application could reduce the challenges you face in operations, please speak with me. Thank you, Christine. Our second speaker is Dr Vicky Jar. She's a research scientist in the Aerospace Division. Her current research interests include human perception, cognition, eye movements and human experimentation. Vicky will be presenting today for us on the topic of improve training by using eye tracking. Thank you, Vicky. Good morning. Um, the ADF is constantly seeking new and improved ways to train more capable operators in a shorter period of time. Live virtual and constructive integration is the future of high end warfighter training in a more complex, contested, and denied environment. Drawing on the experience of working with vegetal operators like those on screen, my team developed a small scale laboratory technology to track the eye movement of a team of operators. This technology will be deployed in large scale and integrated into live virtual instructive, uh, constructive systems to assist assessors, instructors, and the capability managers to improve training performance and <coughs> pardon, warfighter readiness. In addition to provide feedback, this technology will mature to enhance the future of joint and coalition exercises and operations. Our research combined with Aerospace Division strategic strategic uh, initiative will deliver new ways to train high and warfighters in, in a, to a better standard faster. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Our next speaker is Chris Loder from the Maritime Division. Chris will address us today on the collaborative work between DST and VAE in detective corrosing environments with aircraft structures and how it could be used on other ADF platforms to avoid expensive and time-consuming inspections. Thank you. So corrosion costs the Royal Australian Air Force $230 million a year. That's both to find it and to fix. And this is our business as usual, and you don't usually notice it. But when it goes wrong, you have the need to re-wing the Orion or the Hercules, or even to retire fleets early. So DST has uh, developed a, ro um, a robust, low-weight galvanic sensor with a logger that is self-contained, wireless, and has a long battery life. The sensors are used to detect environment uh, and wetness instead of just humidity and to monitor environments in hard to inspect locations on the aircraft. It's flown on the Seahawk Bravo uh, and is qualified for the armed reconnaissance helicopter and will be flying on Wedgetail by the end of the year. It can be applied to other situations as well, such as insulation on ships. Now, installation is necessary, but results in condensation and trapping moisture in hard to inspect locations. And this is a perfect application for our sensor developed in one domain to be used in another. Thank you. We now have Dr. Kevin Hong from Weapons and Combat Systems Division. Kevin is currently leading a small team to develop a high power radio frequency directed energy technologies to defeat emerging threats. He's talked to us today about UAVs and UAV swarms and how to defeat them based on high power radio frequency technology. We all know UAV and small swarms become an increasing threat, but there's a lack of countermeasures, particularly for those fully autonomous UAVs. So today I would like to pitch a novel UAV defeat system that is based on the high power radio frequency technologies. UAV sensors and controllers are full of electronics. Therefore, we can use radio frequency energy to disable, disrupt, and damage UAV electronic system. And if we can deploy a compact RF system on a tactical UAV and fly this to the target area, and it's become integrated airborne system to defeat UAV and the UAV swarm. 
Right now at DST, we are working on the system uh, yeah, system uh, size and weight and power, and we try to you know demonstrate this concept uh, within eighteen months. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Helen Cartledge, who is a senior research scientist and project manager in DST's National Security Science and Technology Centre. Helen will talk to us today about how brain chemistry changes under traumatic stress, blast injury and physical impact that can be measured by using magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This project is jointly funded by Australia and the US with ADF personnel participating in the research. Thank you, Daryl. Um, can I ask you guys to put a hand up if you have ever been psychological screened um, using a uh, by a psychiatrist or psych a psychologist uh, use the ex uh, uh, questionnaires for the hand up. Okay, thank you. Um, so what you're looking at now on the screen is um, spectrum, MRI spectrum. It's they are the, from the two individual brains. And the uh, top one is a healthy brain and the bottom one is from a, P a PTSD sufferer. So this technology could be very useful for the psychiatrist and the psychologist. And also can be very useful for, uh, for doctors and uh, to develop a um, personalized treatment and monitor the recovery journey. See the, t see the peaks you have looking at, and they are the, this is only a small section of this research, uh, the spectrum we can, uh, we have seen. We already found 24 chemistry. And the top, the top, I mean the peaks you see, and they are the sugars, fucose. The fucose one and the three in PTSD brain is reducing. So previous research shows these two sugars responsible for memory and uh, uh, learning capability. So you probably now figure out why we want to know this. This is the first time scientists discover this. And if you want to know more and talk to me afterwards, we need more volunteers. And to, we already have ADF personnel and join us and participate in the scan. If you want to know more and uh, come to see us, uh, Lieutenant Kulan uh, and he got the flies. And the catch is, the catch is, see the sugars, it's not only the chemical we found, we have found others, but the catch is, your brain needs a chocolate. That's only a joke. <laughs> Next speaker is Bryce Dolman. Bryce works in the Weapons and Combat Systems Division where he's developing future rocket and gun propulsion technologies to deliver enhanced capability for the Australian warfighter. Just imagine if you could 3D print explosives or 3D print the fuel for a rocket motor. Or hey, what about 3D printed gun propellants? Well, this is exactly what we're doing at DST. You see, the performance of an explosive or propellant depends upon its shape. And 3D printing, well, you can print any size and shape that you want. And this can give us much greater performance. Now, for defense, this can mean weapons that are lighter and more powerful. Or it could enable rockets to carry more payload and have a longer range. Now, to do this, not only are we looking at the 3D printing process, but we're also developing modelling tools to optimise the design of these explosive and propellant shapes. Now we encourage Defence to continue their support of this research because this will ensure that the ADF is recognised as a world leader in 3D printed energetic systems. Thank you. The next presenter is Julia Freeman from our Chemical and Biological Defence Team in Land Division. Since joining DST Group in 2011, Julia Freeman has been involved with air purifying respirator assessments and canister testing 
red teaming for ADF exercises and primarily testing the suitability of camouflage in different environmental conditions. Julia will talk to us about full systems testing capability of individual protective equipment. We've all worn a garment that doesn't fit correctly, a jumper that rides up, trousers that are too short. For you and I, it's a day of discomfort. For the warfighter in a chemically or biologically contaminated area, it's the difference between life and death. We assess the protective capacity provided by individual protective ensembles by using our environmental test facility. And this guy, our chemical agent resistant articulated mannequin. He is anthropometrically correct and has comparable measurements to the average Australian warfighter. He can wear all the same equipment, and most importantly, he moves just like a soldier to stress the garments in the same way that they do for extended periods of time. The information that we gather during systems testing allows us to provide information back to soldiers on how to maintain correct integration during operations and helps us help procurement officers who have to make those difficult decisions with mismatched procurement cycles. Thank you. Our final speaker is Greg Judd from our Land Division Systems Integration and Technical Networking Group. Greg has many years experience working with the Army to improve tactical command, control and communication systems. He's going to talk to us about his group's current research into how to improve tactical information exchange using an approach called SmartNet. Thank you. In a complex warfighting environment, if you don't know where your friends are, you might accidentally shoot them. The problem is, soldiers can't use mobile phones. They have to use military radios that can be blocked by buildings, the terrain, or even by the enemy. They need automated systems to help them get the right information to the right person at the right time. But current automated systems don't send friendly information at a low rate and at a low priority. What they really need is a system that thinks like they do. We are developing such a system called SmartNet. It will determine the priority and rate of information in accordance with the current military situation. But making such a system is challenging. It hasn't been done before. So we are working with experts in the US Army Research Laboratory, academia and industry. We also need Army's help to ensure that SmartNet makes sensible military decisions as the military situation changes. Thank you. Thank you to all of our pitch presenters. Finally, a keynote presentation will be delivered by Natalie Stevens and Monique Hollick from our National Security Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Division. They will talk about the research and development work DST is undertaking in collaboration with academia and our allies on small satellites to enhance ADF communications. DST is building up expertise in small satellite technologies and space situational awareness to support defence as it grows its space capability. DST currently has a CubeSat called Buccaneer on Orbit. Monique will share some insights on the Buccaneer program and the current mission status. Thank you. Morning everyone, my name's Natalie Stevens and this is Monique and we're space systems engineers with DST. So when we tell people that we're space systems engineers, often the first thing that comes to mind is NASA and the kinds of things that NASA does. So they think we're working with astronauts or on manned space mission, missions or um, interplanetary exploration. Um, but the reality is that Australia's only just getting into space. And so we're working on a much smaller scale. So our focus is on small satellites, starting out with nanosatellites or CubeSats, which are about the size of a loaf of bread. So not quite so grand, but it's still really cool stuff. So today I'll talk a little bit about um, Space 2.0, the new space revolution, Australia's involvement in space, and then the Defence S&T space strategy. I'll finish up with our partnership and collaboration opportunities, and then hand over to Monique, who will talk a little bit more about Buccaneer. So traditionally, space 
has been the domain of big governments. And this is because it's really expensive to get to space, like prohibitively expensive. And the satellites, or traditional satellites, are really big monolithic systems. So, I mean, obviously the International Space Station is really big, but if we look at, this is Landsat, which is an Earth observation satellite. It's 2,000 kilograms, and it's really expensive to launch. Space 2.0 is the new space revolution, and it has a completely different philosophy that is changing the way um, that the global space industry operates. So the emphasis of Space 2.0 is on um, small, cheap and many satellites. And this is driven largely by the miniaturisation of electronics. So just think about your mobile phones and how capable they are uh, for their tiny size. And it means that satellites like our Buccaneer here can actually do meaningful missions despite their tiny size. Now, the rise of small satellites and their popularity <coughs> is also lowering the barriers to space. And this is not just because their launch mass is, is much lower. Um, we all know the amount of kilograms you need to get to space requires more fuel. Um, but also, if they're smaller, we can share, share launches with a um, number of different universities or other, other satellite missions. So what I've got here is a, a few charts. So the top one is actually showing a forecast of the number of small satellites to be launched in the next five years. So if the space industry reaches its full potential, this could be more than 2,000 small satellites. Um, and we're looking at satellites less than 50 kilograms here. More than 2,000 of those could be launched in the next five years. Um, this, the plot at the bottom um, actually shows the percentage of market share, or the, the ownership of these satellites between, at the top is academia and then government, and then at the bottom is the commercial sector. So this is prior to 2016, and then the, the next bar is a current and a future projection. So as you can see, the commercial sector is really taking over um, and the universities are also getting more involved in space. But what about Australia? Here I've got a couple of plots that show what our government spends on space. Um, so if you compare us to some of the other countries, this first plot is in um, millions of US dollars. It's probably not all that surprising that we don't spend very much. But what is surprising is if you look at that expenditure as a percentage of GDP, we're still right down there, like 0.003%, uh, which is really astounding when you think about how reliant we are on space technology for just everyday things like communication, navigation, imagery. Um, and I will note that these figures are five years old, so I think things are getting slightly better. And the Australian space landscape is changing, and it's changing rapidly. So we now have more than 80 Australian space startups, um, which is excellent. We're also getting satellites back into space. So we had four CubeSats launched last year. Three of those were part of the QB50 program, which is an international program, and the fourth one was Buccaneer. So this one's Buccaneer here. And that's a QB50 satellite uh, from the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And also we've all heard the formation of the Australian Space Agency, and so that's helping make us a respected um, global space, uh, I guess, participant. Now, it's no surprise that defence relies on space. Uh, we need it for things like uh, communication, um, earth observation and intelligence, position navigation and timing, uh, think your GPS, um, and also just for weather and disaster management aspects. Um, and if we don't really have any space assets, then where does all this data come from? Well. The truth is we get all of our satellite data from, from other international partners. Um, and this user rather than owner model has inherent risks. What happens if one day that data is not available to us anymore? Suddenly our defence force is crippled. So we really need our own sovereign space capability. And we have some guidance from that from the Defence White Paper of 2016. So the government is aiming to make a more capable, agile and potent future force. And the Defence White Paper acknowledges the importance of satellite and space systems in achieving that vision. And some of the key areas that, in relation to space that it focuses on are situational awareness for superior decision making, communications for a networked force and position navigation and timing for precision effects. Now, space assets are also vulnerable to um, not only space debris, 
but also to advanced counter space capabilities that we know that other countries are developing. So it's also critical that we're able to detect and track objects in space. Now, you can't go from zero to hero overnight, so DSD is working on a defence S&T strategy for space. And it covers not only those technical themes that I just talked about, but also the partnerships and the governance uh, and how that all works together for us to get where we, where we need to, to build this resilient, intelligent space system. That's defence as a whole. Um, if we focus now on DST and our space R&D, we have two main programs that uh, we're currently working on. So the first one is the small satellite experimentation, which is where Monique and I uh, work. And what we're doing is building up space expertise um, in like, space systems engineering. And we're doing that with a very hands-on approach um, because if we're supposed to help defence make informed decisions about space, then we really need to understand what's involved in a space mission and what better way than to build and fly our own satellites. The other key area is space situational awareness. Now, uh, and this links back to that uh, defence white paper goal, where we need to be able to detect and track objects in space. And Australia's really lucky, actually. We've got a very, very capable, capable space situational awareness asset the Space Surveillance Telescope, this one at the top here, actually being relocated to Exmouth in WA and it'll be operational in a few years. And so in preparation for that, uh, there are scientists and engineers at DST that are working on algorithms that will help improve the detection and tracking of objects in space. And so the picture at the bottom um, over here is actually um, DST's Space Surveillance Tool, they call it. Unfortunately, it has the same acronym as Space Surveillance Telescope. Um, but that's what we're using in the interim until the um, telescope is ready and operational. Now, we acknowledge that we are well behind in the space game. Um, and what better way to catch up than through partnerships? So this is with international partners, but also industry and academia. So our team at DST is in two uh, international partnerships. The first one is the Responsive Space Capabilities Memorandum of Understanding. It's a mouthful. But that's got 10 countries involved and we're looking at things like the military utility of small satellites, uh, responsive launch and optical comms and there are a few other key topics. And the other international partnership is Five Eyes Partnership. It's called Square Dance and under that we have a small, sat, um, small satellite project arrangement uh, where we can work together on small satellite missions and learn from them and it also helps us um, with our ground station network. Now closer to home, domestically, um, Defence Innovation has two main programs for um, supporting the research and development aspects of innovation. So the first is the Next Generation Technologies Fund. And so that's looking at more at research and em emerging technologies. And the Defence Innovation Hub is uh, for more mature technologies and transitioning those into um, commercial products. Uh, and more recently, the announcement of the SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre um, is another way that we can help support the defence industry. Um, and that's looking to contribute to Australia's space um, economy, space industry, by looking at space technologies and analytics. So these are all ways that we're trying to partner with um, industry, with academia, and with our international partners um, in order to catch up, essentially. Um, I'll now hand over to Monique to talk to you a bit about Buccaneer. So as Natalie mentioned, my name's Monique Hollick and I'm part of the small satellite team at DST as well. And I'm just going to give a brief overview today of the Buccaneer program and Defence's first CubeSat in space, the Buccaneer Risk Mitigation Mission. So the Buccaneer program is a collaboration between Defence Science and Technology Group and the University of New South Wales, Canberra. And the objective of the program is to develop and operate two CubeSats, the first being the Buccaneer Risk Mitigation Mission, which is currently on orbit and was launched in November last year. And the second CubeSat is the Buccaneer Main Mission, which will build on the lessons learnt from the Risk Mitigation Mission, and it's scheduled for launch in the next 24 months. So the key objectives of the Buccaneer program from DST's perspective is to deploy a high-frequency receiver in space that you might um, see a model of out in the lobby there, um, and that's in order to improve the calibration of the Jindalee operational radar network. 
From UNSW Canberra's perspective, the key objective of the program is to conduct some space situational awareness experiments that involve um, the verification of light curve models related to spacecraft dynamics. And this is in order to improve prediction of the attitude and attitude rates of spacecraft detected from Earth. And a joint but equally important objective of the program from both organisations' perspectives is to develop in-house space capabilities and to train up a team of space experts. So the Buccaneer Risk Mitigation Mission spacecraft itself, um, it's a three unit CubeSat, which means that it's about 30 centimetres long by 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres. So as Dr. Zielinski said before, it's about the size of a loaf of bread, to put that in context. Um, its total mass is about four kilograms, and only about a kilogram of this is actually in the payload. The remaining mass is actually in the spacecraft bus, which is the support system for the payload. We actually purchased um, most of the components of this bus from a company in America called Pumpkin, and they actually specialise in CubeSat buses and subsystem components. And we did actually customise this bus though to our own purposes. So um, for example, our flight software was actually all uh, developed in-house, um, and that allows it to integrate really seamlessly with the payload and to conduct some uh, particular modes that are fit for purpose for our mission. So the spacecraft has four solar panels, um, and as you can see in this image here of them deployed, uh, three of those are actually on one face. And when this face points directly towards the sun, we can generate about 20 watts of power for our spacecraft. We are actually able to control the attitude or orientation of our spacecraft with our attitude determination and control subsystem. Um, and this involves using reaction wheels in order to uh, point the spacecraft in the desired mode. So we can actually, uh, when we want to, we can point these, uh, this solar panel face directly towards the sun. And we can also have the secondary objective of the pointing mode to minimise the drag on the spacecraft by aligning its long axis as closely as possible with the velocity direction of the spacecraft. And this allows us to extend the lifetime of the satellite in space. The payload itself, um, it hosts a 3.4 metre long end-to-end -end high frequency antenna. The antenna is actually made out of Stanley measuring tape, as it is out there in the model. Um, and it was deployed in 12 stages by burning through 12 different pieces of fishing line. So that was a very Australian solution to our payload. <laughs> the payload also hosts an Australian and New Zealand developed GPS receiver called the Kia. Um, and it's provided really accurate position, velocity and time information to our spacecraft, which has been really important for a number of experiments and also for our attitude control. And lastly, the payload also hosts a camera that was developed by UNSW Canberra. And the camera actually, its primary function is to uh, image the high frequency antenna. It, one, of the, one of the antenna elements is in the field of view of the camera. And um, these images verify the structural integrity of the antenna in its fully deployed configuration. Um, and we've, we've done that routinely since we've deployed the antenna. A secondary objective of the camera is to take really cool images of the Earth from space. And the camera's actually provided the first colour images of Australia from an Australian spacecraft, which we're pretty proud of. Uh, in terms of the ground segment, we have two ground stations. One is at DST Edinburgh, and one is at UNSW Canberra. So the spacecraft itself has two communications antennae. One's a UHF dipole antenna, and the other's an S-band patch antenna. So at DST Edinburgh, we have two antennas. The first is a UHF uplink and downlink antenna, and the second is an S-band downlink only antenna, as our um, S-band patch antenna on the spacecraft is for downlink of information only. We've primarily used the UHF for communications to date, um, but we've recently commissioned the S-band antenna, um, and we've successfully decoded signals from the spacecraft via the S-band. Um, it's been a little bit more difficult for us to communicate over S-band because uh, about two or three months back we actually uh, lost one of our reaction wheels in our attitude control unit and that's made pointing a little bit more challenging and pointing is pretty important for our S-band comms because of the lower beam width. Um, both of the antennas are mounted on uh, rotation units that allow us to track Buccaneer as it passes across the sky. And we actually employed a really novel technique to calibrate their pointing direction. Uh, we uh, attached an SLR camera to both of the rotation units and imaged the night sky in various azimuth and elevation combinations. 
um, and used an in-house developed algorithm to identify the stars and their locations in the images, which allowed us to determine, to determine the absolute pointing direction in each of these uh, different locations. So all spacecraft and CubeSats are not exempt from this. Um, they have to undergo some rigorous environmental testing and the primary purpose of this testing is actually to just make sure that your spacecraft isn't going to damage the launch vehicle at all or any of the other payloads on the launch vehicle during launch and deployment. And so for Buccaneer, this involved um, some thermal vacuum chamber testing and also some vibration testing to the, the levels prescribed by NASA, since the primary payload on the launch was actually a large NASA weather satellite. So Buccaneer fortunately passed these tests with flying colours throughout 2016 and 2017. Um, and so it was then moved on for integration into the deployment module for launch in June of last year. We're actually lucky enough to have two of our team members present for this historic moment, and that's Andrew Wobnitz and Garland Hu, as well as UNSW Canberra's Doug Griffin. So launch, oh, oops. Launch was very exciting. Launch occurred finally on the 18th of November of last year after several delays, which is not uncommon for a space mission. Um, so yeah, we just had quite a few launch parties that week because it kept being delayed by a day. <laughs> so lots of barbecues, which we weren't complaining about. Um, launch was from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, and it was on board a Delta II launch vehicle. You can sort of hear the country in the background. Um, it was actually a free ride for Buccaneer um, as part of NASA's educational launch of nanosatellites program. Uh, there were four other CubeSats on the launch as well as the primary payload which was the large NASA weather satellite. You can see them being deployed in the simulation there. Uh, launch was really successful. It delivered Buccaneer to its intended orbit and um, yeah, that was really exciting for us. But there wasn't too much time to celebrate because we had to race back to the office to try and make first contact with the spacecraft which is not an easy thing to do. Um, after launch, there's various orbit uncertainties. Sometimes JSPOT can also misidentify your CubeSat because they are so small and deployed so close together. There's also sometimes some ground station teething issues that you have to get past. So um, we actually spent a lot of time trying to devise a strategy to maximise our likelihood of making contact in those first few passes. Um, and the way we did this was to actually employ a tripwire method at DST Edinburgh, whereby we would point both of our antennae um, in the direction of the calculated point of closest approach of the spacecraft in its first few orbits, and we calculated that point through the orbit parameter message from the launch service provider. And whilst we were pointing at this point in space and just adjusting for the rotation of the Earth, we were just beaconing constantly to give us the best opportunity to contact the spacecraft. And this method was actually really successful. We managed to contact Buccaneer on its very first pass over the Australian continent, which is a very rare feat for a CubeSat team. So we're very proud of that. So um, mission update to date, we've basically achieved all of our mission objectives for the main mission. Um, and that's involved regularly communicating with the payload and achieving data storage. We've successfully deployed the high frequency antenna fully um, and we've verified that that's had no adverse effects on the spacecraft's um, dynamics and we've also taken regular images of one of the antenna elements to verify that it has remained in place, hasn't deformed at all, even under really high space spacecraft attitude rates. We've also used this camera to uh, capture images of Australia from space and other places on Earth, um, which has been a great achievement but wasn't a primary mission goal. Um, and we're still uh, in the process of characterising the GPS receiver performance and that's our goal for the next few weeks to months um, as long as the spacecraft is operational. So this is one of those images of the Earth from space from our onboard payload camera and um, this is actually South Australia in the background um, and you can see one of the elements of the high frequency antenna here and if you look closely enough you can still see the measurement markings on the Stanley measuring tape. So other achievements of Buccaneer, the Buccaneer Risk Mitigation Mission to date, uh, is that we've achieved effective attitude control with both three and two reaction wheels. Um, with the two reaction wheel situation, it is a bit of a modified attitude control mode where we can largely point our solar panel face at the sun, but we can't really control um, 
that uh, the direction of the long axis of the spacecraft to minimise drag. Um, but nine months into the mission, um, it's more important just for us to be sun pointing when we need to. So we're taking that as a win. I guess that's one of the downsides of CubeSats, one of the key downsides of CubeSats is that there is really no size, weight and power um, ability to have redundancy. So we have to just deal with the fact that if you lose something, it's, it's generally, you've lost that function. So we're, we're dealing with two reaction as best we can. We've also conducted an over-the-air flight software update um, just to patch up a few software bugs that we noticed after launch and that was very successful, that update. We've deployed both of the solar panels. Uh, we've achieved continuous, robust and reliable communications over UHF. We've only missed, I think, two days since launch where we haven't communicated with the spacecraft. Um, and we've developed a very effective mission control interface that will be also useful for our follow-on mission, the Buccaneer main mission. Um, it's a very dynamic interface that allows us to change mission plans during a pass and also to have levels and branching within a mission plan so that we can change tack based on feedback from the spacecraft during the pass. Um, it also has allowed us to automate night operations, which has been handy from a sleep deprivation point of view. So we don't actually have to come in at night to talk to the spacecraft and get as much as we can out of it. Um, so yeah, we're moving towards the end of the main mission because as I mentioned, we've nearly achieved all of the main mission objectives for the risk mitigation mission. Um, and we'll be conducting a review of the mission shortly to capture all of our lessons learnt that will then feed into the preliminary design of the Buccaneer main mission. So, does anyone have any questions about Buccaneer or our space strategy? <laughs> and when Natalie and Monique will be available um, yeah, yeah, in the foyer over a light lunch for all your questions. So, um, do, if you join us for lunch, we'll certainly have one. Yeah. <laughs> we can take a couple of questions now if you like. Um, so it will actually uh, be in orbit for a lot longer than it will be functional. Um, so we're expecting it to be in orbit for about five to eight years before it deorbits, and that's also well within the UN guidelines for um, space debris. Um, so, so yeah, we yeah. have to be quite careful about the materials that we have on the spacecraft. So NASA gave us a, a list of what we could have and what we couldn't have, and how how big those components could be, <laughs> such that we would um, or Buccaneer will completely disintegrate on re-entry, so there will be no space debris from Buccaneer. Yeah, but we will try and keep operating, I guess, until it loses its functionality, um, and it will probably do so due to radiation damage, um, because CubeSats typically don't have any radiation hardening and also no redundancy of subsystems, so um, it's likely that in the next 12 months we will, um, yeah, it will stop operating, and yeah, we'll just focus on the next mission, I guess, there's not much you can do. Can you explain the deployment of the impact? You mentioned burning fishing rods. Yeah, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, I can have a go. Yeah, yeah. So, um, make sure when you, when you go out to the lobby, have a look at the model. Um, and what you'll see on the end, I don't think we've got a picture, um, is a little cylindrical shape that we call the tuna can. It's about the size of a tuna can. And so there were four arms of um, tape measure that were coiled around this tuna can. Um, and at various stages, there were 12 of them, there were um, there's some fishing line running over, holding down that tape measure. And this fish, fishing line also ran over resistors. And so at the appropriate time, we would um, signal a burn and run current through those resistors that would heat up the resistors and melt the fishing line in order to deploy 10 centimetres at a time of this fishing line. And it would just go out and out and out. Um, and Dr Zelensky was also there for the 12th burn, um, which is pretty exciting. So um, yeah. And this, this picture here we took before before we deployed the antenna. We should have taken a few more because now we've always got this great big antenna in the way. <laughs> Didn't think of that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. No more questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie and Monique. And I'd now like to hand back to the Chief Defence Scientist for his closing comments. Wasn't that fantastic? So, yes, I think that a uh, great... Uh, little pictures on technology and where we're going with some of the uh, uh, elements. And I think you can see that space is actually going to be a real driver and you can get to space uh, fairly easily now. Um, we're very close to $1 million launch for launching our satellites. The satellites themselves, how much are they costing? 
hundreds of thousands of dollars or thereabouts. So it really is becoming a capability that can be developed. Interestingly, our partners in the US, DARPA, have been talking to us about um, a project they've got called Blackjack, which is effectively they want to uh, populate uh, low or Earth orbit with uh, a matrix of uh, or a network of uh, small satellites, which are all doing uh, mi distributed missions and communicating amongst themselves. And this is a way to mitigate against the single point of failure with some of their geostationary satellites. And the idea is if they are, they go out of orbit or they're damaged in any way by even by adversaries, you can very quickly deploy a replacement ones. So it really becomes, uh, if your satellites are really li literally costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, orbit, uh, sorry, deployment is less than a million and someone's got missiles that cost millions of dollars to, to take down, it actually becomes uneconomical to do that. So it's a really interesting strategy. And I think Australia is very well positioned now to actually go into that kind of program as a joint program. For a while we were just out of the game because we couldn't compete with the sheer capital costs and all the technology development has gone on in previous years. So it was really fitting, I thought, that when we did launch uh, Buccaneer last November, it was on the 50th anniversary of Resat, which was uh, the first satellite launched by Australia in 1967. Uh, in, at the what was called the Weapons Research Establishment in Edinburgh, which is the forerunner to the modern day DST. So we comp we're back in space 50 years later and actually at the cutting edge again. And, uh, and one of the things I was really delighted about uh, Natalie and Monique and getting them to showcase this work is that anyone can do uh, this kind of work. And uh, sometimes we think that uh, it's all that, uh, led by you know, senior scientists. Young people can do this kind of work. They're right on the edge and great to see young women engineers and you know, scientists contributing and leading our team. So congratulations to all our presenters today. Can you please uh, join me and uh, congratulating them on great presentations. <laughs> so it's time to, we have some refreshments on for you, so please stay, uh, have, have a refreshment, but most importantly, talk to our, our scientists. Thank you very much. <laughs>